This is the Blue Room. It is your weekly show. It is your post Merseyside derby win for Everton show. Up the toffees. Absolutely buzzing. Been so happy all day. I am exhausted, but I can't wait to talk about that game in a bit more detail. Joining me, I'm sure, are three lads who want to get stuck into it as well. Pete McFarlane. Pete, how are you, mate? And anyone watching on YouTube, do you want to describe your background you've got on the Zoom call? I've just got a um, a legend scoring in the Gather Street against uh, against our illustrious neighbours. Uh, yeah, fantastic, mate. I'm feeling great. I d- I'll be honest. I woke up this morning, um, and I felt hungover, and I haven't drank in five years. So <laughs> that's the only way you can describe it. I was aching all over, um, feeling absolutely shattered, and I kind of woke up and thought, did that really happen? And then, yeah, it did. And I'm, I'm I'm on top of the world. Sensational, uh, Adam Sutton. How are you, mate? I'm good. I didn't wake up this morning because I didn't go to bed last night. Um, so unlike Pete, I kind of remember it happening. Uh, but I also feel even more than hungover. Uh, but some feel unlike it's... I've been a, a big critic and have distanced myself from Everton a lot over the past year or so. But last night drew me right back in. That was some feeling. And uh, yeah, still riding the high now. Absolutely. Um, Mick, saw you in the Denby around 1am last night. How, how's the head this morning? Did you, did you uh, nice to recover and get through the day and work all right? I don't think much work got done, Mike, but <laughs> drain, dra- drained is the word. I think still in a little bit disbelief, like even just coming home from work today, I was like, you know, last night happened. It was quite, quite emotional this morning as well, actually. It kind of started to set in a little bit. Um, one of them, you know, for 14 years, I, I think the last last one, 2010, I remember I couldn't get a ticket for that one. So last night was the first time live seeing us win a derby. So, yeah, it, was a, it felt like a big milestone and a lot of emotion came out of full time and everything. So, yeah, just yeah. I think that I think last night, I think everyone deserved last night, the players, the fans, the manager, the whole club, really, considering I suppose the context of the season. Um, and obviously the context of the match of it being Jürgen Klopp's final Merseyside derby as well. I think everything just tallied up and lined up perfectly almost. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how the Reds do it, if this is how you feel after every derby win. Like, it, it must it must take hell to you. I'm not sure I could feel like this twice a year, but uh, w- listen, un- unbelievable night. And do you know what, Mick? I'll, I'll come back to you because something that you you replied to me on, on Twitter last night and you know, I sort of said that I was just so happy that the Goodison Park got a not a send off because we've got you know a season and a bit left to go there, and hopefully we'll have a few amazing nights under the lights next season for the team that that it isn't down in the relegation places and isn't is maybe pushing on in a cup competition or something like that. But but you sort of defiantly re- replied to me. I don't know if this was after a few pints saying there's there's no way that Goodison's last derby win could have been 14 years ago. That 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 could that cannot that simply could not not happen and. It just, you know, the sort of force of will and, and defiance in, in, in how you wrote that. It sort of felt like that's the kind of mindset the players and the managers had last night. It was like this this is just this is not gonna happen. You aren't gonna you aren't gonna come here and roll us over. When we went a goal ahead, we went two ahead. We were on the ropes at times, but you know, you aren't getting past this this is gonna be our night. And it just the whole game, the whole performance just sort of just fizzed with that mentality of thought. Yeah, I think defiance is, is the perfect word because I think I think the whole performance kind of you know resembled that to be honest. You know, almost the even before we scored the first 20, 25 minutes, I was almost gobsmacked of how we how well we were playing and actually how we we'd approach the game. You know, it would have been very easy, I think. And one of my worries actually coming into the game was the fact that because we won on Sunday and ought to be the bigger game with, with Brentford on Saturday, it was almost like it could be a little bit distracted and a little bit, you know, not as focused to 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 try and win the game or at least try and get something out of it because we 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 know if you know we beat Brentford on on Saturday as much as you know three points is, is the exact same tally. I suppose if we won last night or did win last night, you know, I think everyone kind of knew or thought that Saturday was the more important. And I was worried that the impact that could have had last night, and and yet we came out the blocks in in the absolute perfect fashion. You know. I think bombarded is, is is probably the word I'd use. We absolutely bullied them at times, and obviously it got a little bit nervy at other times. But still, that I suppose that that mentality that has been missing from 
from pretty much the majority of Everton sides for for many many years, and I was I was just really really impressed by everyone to be honest because I did I, I just did not did not see that type of that type of performance in them, and um, you know I think like like I, like I said before, and I just reiterate that. It felt like that type of performance was needed from everyone, just from a like from a unity type of perspective, really. And I think you know Goodison's not felt like that for a very long time. You know we've had some decent results this year, and we've had some decent nights in the last couple of years in terms of the emotion and the the, the passion that's I suppose carried the team. But last night it felt like the other way around. Last night didn't feel like uh, um, previous big night games where we've you know been under the caution. We've had to carry the team. You know from minute one it felt like. You know the, the players were up for, for for that as much as we were, and I think that was the most impressive thing. And and, and we we spoke last night, and I've said it. It's quite a few people. I think, you know, one of the another impressive thing really was that you know it two nil almost flattered them really. You know, we, we've had a number of chances in, in the first half, and and in the second half, th- th- despite how the first half ended, you know they hit the hit the post, and 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 that was it really. We we restricted them to to, to very little and. It was a really well-rounded performance, and you know, if, if we were gonna win yesterday, that that's exactly how we were gonna do it, and we, we played it to perfection. I think. Yeah, Pete, it's it's one of them. Looking back a few weeks ago, and I think there were people looking at where this game was gonna go on the calendar, and people talking about maybe in the last week of the season, and you know, maybe not yourself so much, but certainly the, the more negative-minded of us were going, they're going to win the title in that game and, and relegate us. And it was it was a fixture that was sort of creeping up and we were approaching with trepidation. But listen, like, of course, we want the football club to be better in every aspect. We want to be higher up the league. We want to be competing more. We want to be in a better shape off the pitch. But like, I just think for the significance of, of us moving from this stadium and what the next year is going to be like and and the the memories that we're going to sort of take forward if I want to get too deep like for the rest of our lives really about what Goodison was like at the end and, and the moments and the nights we had like just sitting there today thinking like at least we'll always have that like that, that that that's not going to change now we will always have that last derby under the lights of Goodison where they came on the charge for the title fancy themselves and and we sent them packing and it was absolutely marvellous yeah, I mean, one thing that really struck me last night, um, like I was talking to a lot of my mates who bring their kids with them, you know, to the game, and the amount of them who turned around and said, you know, he wasn't born, she wasn't born, the last the, they, the last time we won at Goodison in a derby, and when you think that that's the type of thing that I think about as well, where I'm look, you know, there's, there's these kids who are 12, 13 years of age, who've who've had season tickets for years, who've never seen us win a derby at Goodison Park, they've had to go into school. On the Monday or the, you know, what would have been today, Thursday, they've had to go in the next day and, and, and take a little bit of stick off their mates every single time for, you know, for as long as they've lived. Um, so it's 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 important for just things like that as well. When you think about, you know, in terms of what what as an Evertonian, as a kid growing up in this city, let's be honest, it's gonna be difficult to actually, you know, keep that same passion and keep that same commitment. And I think that's why we, you know, when we say about, you know, Evertonians are born, not manufactured. You know, you, if you support Evan, you've always got to support them for the right reasons, whether it's family connection, whether it's just a love, just the general love that bite, that bites you. Um, and anyone who supports Everton, uh, they support us for the right reasons. And I think it, it's it's time, it's nights like last night that will live long in the memory, not just for us who've obviously waited so long to see that, but also for the younger kids who are now who now see what it's about and and can now see what it feels like to win a Merseyside derby. And and let's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. We've taken an absolute beating off them. I mean, you know, not not just in Merseyside derbies. I mean, when we've been at our lowest over the last couple of years, when we've had all kinds of stuff going on off the pitch with boardroom up, you know, unrest with, you know, all of the, you know, th- um, protests against the board with all these things, with points deductions, with Premier League, the call was cheats, they're doing this, that, the other. Any excuse for them to put the, to stick the boot in, they've taken it. Um, and I just find it absolutely incredible and I'm absolutely delighted that we've managed to get them back in the best way and we've possibly just cost them the league title. And I don't mean to sound really bitter by saying that, but quite frankly, they deserve it. Um, I think we've all <laughs> taken we've all taken so much stick over the last couple of years. Um, it might be bitter of me, it might be short sighted of me, 
you know, I'll probably have Reds who'll say, oh, well, it's good for the city for us to win the league. Well, do you know what's good for the city? Having two league, having two teams in the in the Premier League in this city. Um, so quite frankly, I'm absolutely delighted that they once again lost the league at Goodison Park. Amazing. Uh, just just interesting there, Adam, what, what Pete was saying about like kids and going to school. Like I've I felt like that today. Like I've got me Everton hoodie on. Like I've got like me Everton mug with me name on, which I've had in the, in the cupboard for years, which you don't really dig out. But it's like, I like I suppose like down the years we've we've gone into these games and because we lose in heartbreaking fashion or we just lose in in meek fashion, we we do that self preservation thing, don't we? Of oh, you know, doesn't hurt anymore or, or or all this kind of stuff. But it, it you know it should hurt and we should feel nervous and we should we should feel the the nerves and the anxiety before these games because it, it should matter and that I think last night and you know sort of watching us try and see it out and hold on and and get over the line like we haven't led in a, in a derby at Goodison since 2013 in, in in any in any game so like to, to even to even feel that again was just like what is this this, this is so new and it's horrible but my god if, if we're not here for that what, what are we in this for yeah and I think it again it comes down to the fact that we, we are we're not in this for success. We never have been in this for success because one, we never have any. And two, as my dad would have said, success is for wimps. We're here because we are born and not manufactured. It, it is a point where I'm taking a dog for a walk 20, 20 minutes, half an hour ago, and there's a lab walking down the road to the Everton jumper on, and I'm laughing my head off going like, you wouldn't have worn that. You wouldn't have worn that. But at the same time, that's that's the best feeling because – you do see our fellas walking around in Everton hats and Everton jumpers. And when you do see a kid in a full Everton kit, you go like, top up the toffees, lad, and you walk past him or you'll say hello to them or you know, give a touch of your ball type of thing because that's that's what we are. We aren't, again, here to you know ride the wave of success. We aren't here to be the glory hunters. We don't win a trophy every season. We don't win a derby every decade. But when it comes to winning one and when it comes to feeding, and, and again, I'm, I'm not too fussed about Liverpool. I'm not, I'm not actually that arsed about Liverpool because they're so far away from us, not just from a success point of view, but from an emotional standpoint that that's when it does feel boss to see a lad in an Everton top on holiday because you don't see that every so often. That's why it is so boss that, I don't know, 20 minutes to go last night, I'm going, I might just drive to Denby, me, but I don't want to jinx it. And I live about an hour away from it. And I'm thinking like, what, why, why is that feeling of, again, being so low at times and, and the majority of the time why is it so worth it when you get that little ounce of, of happiness? And again, it comes down to what the lads have said, that we, we deserve this. And it's been such a long time coming, whether it was Liverpool or whether it was someone else last night. Of course, it feels so much better that, that it is them. But that performance last night wasn't just in, in the derby. And, and Mo's alluded to it in the post-match last night. It, that, that wasn't a, a win like a derby would feel. That was just a brilliant Everton performance that puts you your one foot in the Premier League again next year. But then also what we've kind of maybe been missing in terms of an identity, in terms of a style of play, in terms of what you want that Everton team and manager and stadium to sound, smell and look like, all came to fruition last night. And yeah, it feels obviously brilliant. And I think we're all riding the wave of being a little bit tired, a little bit hungover, whether that is from having a bevy or not. But yeah, long may it continue. And, and we can actually look forward to to a game now and I've just looked at tickets to go and watch them in, in London like, I never do that why am I doing that what game are you looking for <laughs> the Arsenal one <laughs> if we're safe by then I'd want to get beat 10-0 and um, you can get down there sing songs have a bevy and yeah um... enjoy yourself because as I said it, it doesn't happen very often and that performance last night has put us in good stead I can feel it yeah it's you so right about the performance and, and like I think the first half an hour was just just so good, wasn't it? Just you, you could bottle that. That is that is Everton at Goodison, isn't it? And, and what you want to see from us. And you know, I've, I've read, I've read and listened to loads of stuff today, Mick. And, and one of the sort of common themes from from outside of our bubble really is that you know, and I think I think Klopp said this last night in the sense that well, we knew what was coming, but we we couldn't stop it. And they they were sort of a little bit baffled as to as to how they they couldn't stop it. But I suppose it's it's the same in in any aspect of football, isn't it? If, if you've got a, a player who's really good at you know it's the old Iron Robin thing, isn't it? You know, you know where he's gonna go, but but stopping him doing it is is one thing. And listen, I'm not saying we've got players who are that good, but if you've got players who, who know about a plan and, and they execute that plan really well. And I think Ed was talking a bit about this a bit on the, the post match last night. It's like it's one thing being able to say, 
we're going to go in against these, get loads of free kicks and just bombard the, the box. But it's another thing to actually have composure at times to, to draw the foul and get the free kick. It's another to put the ball in the right area. It's another to time the jump well to, to win the header and, and you know, to, to react to that. And I think those aspects, I think, of what, what we've done last night, I think, have got a little bit underrated. I think the execution of, of, of so many aspects of that first half of an hour were, were, just, were just so good in such a... You know, an environment where it would have been easy for everyone to get carried away and lose the head. They just they, they got all those little basic things, which lead to, you know, a, a great set piece sequence coming off really spot on. Yeah, I, I think when when I say beforehand about you know the, the game plan was played to perfection, that's exactly what I'm on about. And I think Dice mentioned that as well. And that really what made last night was the the there was the the execution and the delivery of the the tactical plan. And I think, you know. Before last night, the way we played in the first half hour was exactly how absolutely everyone would have wanted us to play that game. And and I'm sure there's been previous, we know for a fact that there's been previous times where the plan would have been the exact same against that level of opposition. You know, we said it all season long, even going back to, to Anfield, you know, that same type of aggression that you want to implement, but ultimately you're playing against a far superior team and it's difficult to actually try and get that across when, you know, Really, not just are they a much better technical and footballing team than us. They've got a load of powerful and strong physical players in there themselves. And to, for us to go and overpower them and outwork them and bully them and outmuscle them, but also outthink them at the same time, I thought we were really, and you alluded to it, to it there, I thought we were really street smart last night. You know, the amount of times that, especially in derbies under the lights, we, we've gone out and we've gone really hot headed, really, you know. I, I might I really think back to the, the the Benitez game and that you know we went full almost we went we went two over the cost really where you know any time you turned over the ball they they were in and you know we were four 0 down or four one down and you know last night we we, we weren't just gung ho but we were, we were aggressive we were aggressive in the right ways we were so mature in how we we won fouls that probably weren't you know we're fifty fifty whether they were fouls or not but we won them anyway and then. You know the consistency of what actually makes this Everton team good at the moment was was, was outstanding last night. You know that the, the set pieces from from McNeil were, were were unreal. You know the you know I mentioned earlier this morning that uh, and James Harkowski and, and Jared Brantwaite and obviously Dominic Cavalli with the goal. You know I don't remember an Everton team this good at not not this good at just generally set pieces, but always winning. The first contact at set pieces, you know, Tarkowski in particular is just absolutely outstanding at that every time at the far post or, or the near post. Um, and they, they just couldn't handle it. You know, it's a little bit funny looking back at some of the, the highlights, you know, who who was marking certain zones. And, you know, you, you've got to wonder whether the homework was done 100% because it's not exactly how I would have set up to try and um, prevent an Everton team at set pieces, but not just that, also how. You know, we 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 broken in transition. You know, Calvert Lewin had probably one of his, his best games in Goodson for a very long time. You know, against two very good cent- central defenders, the fact that one of them had to get hooked with with twenty minutes to go, alongside then two other fullbacks who who, who, who did the same. You know, I, th- I think you're absolutely spot on in terms of that the the delivery of the game plan, but the absolute consistency. You know, it wasn't just in in little spells. You know, apart from really the the last ten minutes of the first half. You know, it was absolutely it was it was a perfect performance and and, and perfect in, in different ways and in, in the way of how front foot and front foot and how aggressive we were in the first half to, compared to, to how well we defended in the second half. You know, it, it couldn't have gone any better really. And it's just just it's even just think about it back. You know, it just want to go. I was hope I'm hoping now that it's Wednesday again so we can go and watch it all over again live. But but yeah, yeah, it's um it's one of them. Pete, the first half and I like it. Like I said, before we scored, we, we were so good. And then it was almost like we scored and we didn't quite know what to do then. <laughs> I've, I've never I've never known uh, Goodison to be so desperate for the half-time whistle. Like, the way everyone was whistling and the way in which, like, I was looking up at the clock, I was like, this feels like it's, like, full-time now. <laughs> that was the only time in the game we were, we were really stretched there. But, I mean, that that that, that opening half an hour just... Uh, I think I think if, if if this is going to work for Dice in the long term and and the way in which which we're going to play like that that feels like the blueprint for for playing these sides who you know like Nick said who, who are who have got superior quality to us and who are higher up the league because 
as as good as any team could be. I, I don't think many teams will, will, will handle Everton playing like that in that atmosphere, you know, that well. Yeah, I think the atmosphere was massively important as well, Matt. Um, I think that's the best I've seen Goodison for for a long time, a long, long time. Um, and I think it just shows that when everything comes together. We can obviously we, we can go toe to toe with anyone. I think over the years we've proved that we've proved proved that numerous times under David Moyes, for example, that we could we could go against the so called bigger sides and get these results. And inevitably, it was always when we had the the crowd on side and and everyone was pulling in in the same direction. Um, I mean, talking about like leading up to half time last night, I don't know what any, anyone else was like. Maybe it's the Evertonian in me, but when at the end of the match, when it went into injury time and we're two 0 up. And I looked at me th- um, at my mate next to me and said, "Would you take a draw?" Because <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> "I'm a lot going into injury time. I'm still because the Evertonian in me says that you know that something inevitably will go wrong, especially when it's them." So it was just it was just nice for us to actually see that through as well. I thought the second half, like you say, I mean this this wasn't like a snatching you know, you know a smashing grab sort of performance. This wasn't one where where. You know, I'm sure they would have been delighted if even even as to have the excuse of that they dominated possession or they dominated, you know, chances and things like that. I don't actually think last night there was that air of inevitability about Liverpool that that you so often see when you come up against teams like them. And um, whether it was Man United over the years when they were really successful, or Manchester City, um, even Chelsea. You know that that air of inevitability just didn't seem to really really kick in for me. Apart from the fact that the Evertonian in me was telling me that something will eventually go wrong, but I think, I think yeah, I think that the, the players have stepped up. The, the the managers obviously stepped up. I'm loving Tracky Dice as well. I, I think that that's a really a really nice touch. Um, I'm 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 just yeah. I, I just I just look at us now, and if this is the blueprint going forward, then yeah, br- bring it on. Give me more of it because that's the type of Everton performance I want to see. I think as well, I'd like. Obviously, the last fifteen minutes, of the first half were torturous, weren't they? Because I think that's, I mean, that's the their best spell in, in the game, isn't it? And they, they go behind, them, but like they used to be in that situation, and they just step it up a little bit. But you know, the thing, the thing I was sort of saying to me, me dad in in the ground in the second half when they were doing something similar was that it always felt like because of those first that first half an hour, like if we could get them down at the Gladys Street for just five minutes, I'll have two or three corners and just a few crosses into the box. I remember saying to me that vividly, like after about 15 minutes, like, we just get them down here and get a few in, we'll score again. Because because I think we did so much damage to them with the way in which we attacked from set pieces in the first half. But, you know, like Mick said there, you had Alexander Arnold, Mark and Carl <laughs> at the back post for, for the goal we eventually score, which is absolutely ridiculous from, from that point of view. And as much as I was worried about them having the ball and, and probing us a little bit, it always felt like once we eventually and inevitably did get up our end that we we wouldn't keep them there for 10 minutes but in the two three four five minutes we had them down there if we really went at them properly then we could make it play yeah I think there's again there's so many variables that go into a good performance and then also good parts of of a game and the first one I think is like before that game the forest win and the, the fallout from the forest debacle that just gives everyone a little bit of a, a breather. So when you do, then second variable start a game really well, then you're on side straight away. If if you go one 0 down in that game, then everyone goes, oh god, here we go again. So as you say, that coming into the game, everyone's up for it. It's probably a little bit of a calmer, more I don't know, easy to understand if the, the players aren't at it. Atmosphere. Second of all, you start the game really well, and, and you start not well just from a physical point of view and intensity point of view but there's so many times I've watched Everton against big teams and and we did do it towards the end of the game where it's anywhere time and you're just lashing the ball away and it's trying to get the ball as far away from our goal as possible but there's a few times in that first half where they were having their spells after him one up that Adrissa Gay gets the ball and he looks like he's going to go and boom one into a channel and he just chops one inside for someone and it's almost like that that win on the weekend maybe Sean Dyche maybe Again, probably gets away from us how good the Drissigate has been in that period between when he left us and when he's come back. Really, that, that there's almost like a well, I've got a calm head here. I'm not. I'm not just going to let this become the Alamo. I'm going to maybe take a, a bit of a risk or trust my ability to go and just pop one into Decore and get one back, and then maybe go out wide. And then you look at your Harrisons and your McNeils who aren't blessed with any pace, but 
yesterday it looked like when they were dribbling with the ball, they, they weren't blind alley runners. They, they were trying to keep the ball, give us a little bit of a breather, turn back inside, then you pop it back to your, your, your full back or then you pop it back into midfield. And and as you say, get, in, get into a stage in the game where you ride your luck, you, you have a little bit of a period where your centre half have got to go and head things and block things and, and your midfield has got to go and nick, nick a ball off their midfield who's about to, to let a shot off. We've, we've just done it perfectly. And again, apart from the, the couple of chances which you feel it's just going to be a, a goal every single time and Jordan Pickford stepping up. It, um, it, it wasn't, again, the, the hysterical derby everyone going absolutely ballistic when when they're about to to score because it was it was planned to perfection but also as as the lads have spoken about it was executed to perfection as well and i suppose Mick, the the mad thing is that 10 days ago we were as as low as it could be weren't we after that after that chelsea game you know we had les and warren on the podcast who who went early warren went i think after half an hour and i think we were all rightly very down in the dumps after that and I think, I think we've all been critical of the manager to varying degrees this season. Like it felt like after that game, it did really ramp up a little bit. One one win in fifteen, and I think we all sort of identified this week as the week where we'd find out where we're going to ultimately be. Whether the end of the season is going to be a horrific one and a nervy one, or maybe one we can relax a little bit. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for the way in which he's got everyone back together after after that Chelsea game, um, because. I felt like I was on my knees and ready to, to sort of call it a day with Everton after after that game. Um, didn't really feel anything. I was so apathetic towards the situation and seeing Mashiri sat there on the stand just worrying about where we're going. But, you know, they've, they've not let that creep in, clearly. They, they, I don't know what they've done. I don't know if it is just the tracky, but something something has obviously changed, hasn't it, behind the scenes in that week. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's worked magnificently. Yeah, not not just the, the the Chelsea game itself, but but the reaction and, and in particular the Dyche's comments in the build up to the the Forest game, which were were quite ballsy, pretty much calling out the the, the players and, and and the club as a whole, really. And that if this is the pretty much saying this is now really in you know the, the stage of the season where as as has been for pretty much every season since two thousand sixteen seventeen, other other than. Other than uh, Ancelotti's full season, where or Silva's full season as well, sorry, where you know the manager's been on a horrendous run, you know players look like they've thrown the towel, and this is where the manager gets sacked, and then someone else comes in, and and and, and we do it all again in twelve months' time. And I, I remember thinking Chelsea game, thinking back to the the post match pod that we did after um, the Newcastle home run last year at Goodison, and and I said, you know, we, we might still stay up. Last last season, obviously, eventually, we did, eventually we did. But but the reality is, with the the state the club is in, um, we'll, we'll we'll more than likely just be here all over again, potentially with, with another manager, with another squad of players. Little did we know, you know what what's gone on this season, um, but 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 the, that was a real, I think, a real I suppose line in the sand when when Dice came out with those comments, because it was he came out swinging. They were ballsy. It was either like you know. Because they could have easily backfired, you know. There's a, there's a lot of players in that in that squad who, you know, been here for a while, who've been here for a while, and have been a part of some really, you know, mentally weak squads, and have, have thrown plenty of managers under the bus in the past. Um, you know, sometimes for, for good reason, rather than he says. Um, but you know, it, it, it could they could have easily swung the other way. So to then have. In reaction to a six 0 defeat, in reaction to those comments, in the build up to the biggest week of the season, to go back to back two 0 wins against our biggest rivals, probably for for, for for safety, and then our biggest rivals in the league, and and to do so in in such a, a battling and, and and you know defiant way that like you mentioned beforehand, you know, I think some you know somewhere wherever he's wherever he's sat now at home, he'll, he'll be chuckling himself dice because he knows that. That's a little victory, you know, mentally with with that group of players, and probably with a, a large portion of the fan base as well. That, in in many ways, in, in many managers who who would have came out like that, you know, it would hundred percent would have gone the other way. And you know, I I think, I think it's probably a big turning point now. You know, who knows what will happen in the summer? But if if he ends up staying and 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 you know happens next season, I think we'll probably look back on on this week hopefully in a positive way. 
Yeah, I mean, th- there's no better way to buy yourself time, Peter, than to beat Liverpool. Like, not not many managers have been able to do that in this <laughs> eight year cycle we've had, where we've we've sacked the manager every year. But if you wonder if maybe a couple of them had a, a few more derby wins under the belt, they'd, they'd be able to last a few more months and get their ideas across and kind of ride out the storm. But you know, if it, it feels like it's it's mad, but like after these two wins and us probably staying up and people feeling better, like. I don't think there's any going to be any real doubt about him staying over the summer now. It feels like it's it, it's pretty secure just just to, on the back of those two results. No, I mean, what was the, what was the thing that he that he referred to himself as the Messiah? We, uh... Yeah, that, that, that is bold, isn't it? The to be six nil. To be fair, was, do you know what though? I I personally didn't didn't dislike that because I, I genuinely think all he was doing was pointing out the the extremes of how people react. We do it with players. We do it with players all the time where we say one minute they're the best in the world or the best, you know, the best right back we've seen or the best winger we've seen, and they have a couple of bad performances and and all of a sudden they're rubbish and, and they can't they can't kick a ball. So I think he was just using that. I think his sense of humor is so dry that he uses extremes. A bit like with the Dan Humor thing when he said about him flying, you know, getting a pri- private plane to, to Finch Farm. He said he'd have a word with him. And people took him so literally, and I thought, no, come on now. But I think I think that that was such a a defining week in our in our well in our season it could be in our history to be honest with you because I think if we if if we I mean we're not technically safe at the moment like but I'd like to think that we can push on now and and, and confirm our status in the Premier League I think if we would have gone down this season I think I was really worried about the future of our club as in being a, in existence so the pressure that the Dice has actually been under as well given the points deductions given everything else. Um, for him to have come out and and basically had a bit of a reset as well, um, to get the players up and, and ready and and, and fighting uh, for the, for the supporters, um, I think it's also a lesson to us, us as Evertonians. Obviously, any manager who doesn't win a game in fifteen, get you know, doesn't win a single match in fifteen, is going to be under huge pressure. But what I would say is, it shows that sometimes just just sticking with it and and maybe giving giving managers a little bit of time and. and and just having that that little bit of faith that we can get it right, maybe going forward, that's something that we can take on board as well. Um, because I I do genuinely believe that, given the position we're in, given the financial constraints, given points deductions and everything else going on, I don't really see a manager who could have done a better job in this in this position. I'm not I, I'm you know you'll have people who'll, who'll start throwing names at me. Who's gonna who would have wanted to have come to Everton Football Club? Say for example, if we would have got rid of Sean Dyche after the Chelsea game. Who do people realistically think would have come to Everton Football Club at that point and taken over and 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 taken over for these last six games? And do you really think that they would have got the results so far? You know that that, that he would have. I I personally believe that Sean Dyche is is the right manager for this particular period in our football club, which is all about trying to have some stability, making us hard to beat, and basically getting us into that new stadium while still being a Premier League club. Um, I, I think obviously the the question marks over the new ownership are huge. Um, I, I'm I'm not a fan at all of 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 these potential owners. I'm really I'm hoping and praying that there's going to be some kind of last minute savior who's going to come in and, and and change and change our fortunes. But if it is going to be seven seven seven, we need we need stability somewhere. And and I don't see a manager who would come in and and offer that. And and certainly offer that on a, under a budget, under such a small budget, with all kinds of other things hanging over them. So so yeah, I've got a, got a lot of time for Sean. Like, got to apologise before as well. What I, um, me, me dog Whiskey Blue started kicking off because I think he had the uh, the cop eye kids from next door. So he's <laughs> <laughs> he was he was giving them a bit of stick. But anyway, um, but yeah, Daish, I, I I've got a lot of respect for him. I, I think I think people need to sometimes. Not take him so literally is what I'd say because I think once you sort of get onto that very dry sense of humour that he's got, he you actually start to realise that he's actually quite funny. Yeah, um, back on back on the game, I'd let's let's talk about the the big man, the main man who's who's there left highest on Pete's uh, background picture. There you go, you can see it. That's it's going to be the iconic image, isn't it? Um, and I suppose you know. Sort of leading it from the manager in into Carvalho, loon I suppose one of his big triumphs has been able to get this lad on the pitch a, a lot more. And listen, he's not always scored the goals. He, he's not always played well, but he has looked fitter. He, he has looked stronger. And 
I mean, he's not looked as fit and as strong and as good as last night in the Italy for a long time, but it was just, um, it's just bliss, isn't it? Big number nine, Gladys Street. And as Mick, I think, said to me in the, the pub last night, that the beautiful thing about that goal was that there's just no way VAR could have ruled it out. Um, no chance of offside, no chance of the of the corner going out, no one stood in front of Alisson. Um, it was just a beautiful, pure Everton moment. And, and, and Dom... Of everybody, I think is is, is most deserving of it. Yeah, I, I've again been a massive critic of Dominic Calvert Lewin because it, the criticism comes from you've seen you've seen what he can do before, and it almost looks like sometimes. And we don't get a, I don't know a view into tactics and the way that he's been told to play and move and, and work and stuff. And he has been so unlucky with his injuries and with his run of form and. You know, breaking your cheek or Jack Harrison flicking his thigh out and scoring and, and little things like that would have such a massive impact on, on someone who, let, let's have it right, is is as, pre, is, is, is as normal as us, by the way. You, you can tell in the way that he communicates, the way that he does interviews, the way that he, he looks when he scores a goal or he plays well. That he, He's just a lad who, and, and he says it himself, it, it, his, it, the pressure of being there at number nine is is what he wants and, and what he feels. And the reason why we're so critical, so, well, such big critics of Dominic Calvert Lewin is because we want him to do the best out of everyone. That, that's what it comes down to. If you wear the nine and you play for Everton and you're big, you're strong, you're rapid and you score goals, it doesn't matter who your fancy foreign winger is or who your technical midfielder is. You're the lad who everyone wants to, to, to do the best. And, and yesterday was amazing for him. And you could see the relief when he scored. It, it wasn't like a, I don't know, going ecstatic it was just like this is why I'm here and I think he you know, pointed to the ground didn't he when he, when he scored and it wasn't just the goal it was the Carver Lewin of old who is holding the ball up who is giving defenders an absolute nightmare but then at the same time like he he looked he looked like quick on his feet and he was bouncing stuff and he was getting hold of something and, and pinging it back and the biggest criticism I've had of him is like sometimes when a ball comes into him I can't remember what game it was I think it was away at maybe like, I can't remember, maybe away or home a couple of weeks ago where like the ball comes into him and it just like bounces out for a throw in and he looked abject. He looked like I'm shattered, I'm isolated and I'm not even getting a chance to score a goal. Whereas the past two or three weeks, he's been getting chances and the chances have either been luck, i.e. your Burnley goal, or they've been go on then, go and show us like last night or like Newcastle and he's, and he's done both. And, and that's where you start to get real confidence and you start to get a real run of form. Because if that man, I think I said it's the last time, Matt, that night, if that man can score five to seven goals between the last time we spoke and the end of the season, Everton will stay up pretty com- comfortably. And actually, I don't think there's going to be many people sniffing around for him this year because he hasn't played enough or scored enough. Dominic Calvert-Lewin in, in his last season at Goodison could really take himself to a top level going to Bramley Moore. And that comes from the manager bad in his time and also him getting his break, which he, he so, so deserves. I think as well, Mick, and like I, me and you were at that, that Villa game earlier in the season where he, he goes off with the, the cheek injury that, that Adam mentioned. And I, I think at that point, there was a, a sort of a building feeling around Calvert-Lewin that he was just a bit soft in the sense that, you know, remember that day there were people unhappy that he seemed to have took a, a little bang on the face as it as they fall from the away end and he and he'd gone off. I think there were some times, you know, when he had those injuries and we were, everyone was trying to just scratch in the red as to why. It was like, well maybe he's just one of these players. Like I mean people used to say about Daniel Sturridge, didn't they? Like, oh, they're not willing to play through the pain. Um last night he was ill, wasn't he? He had a he had a hamstring strain. I don't think he trained all week. And I think I think that's part of his game and, and his, his mentality. He maybe doesn't get enough credit for. I think I think the fact that he does get injuries. I think, I think the, the the perception of what he's like away from the pitch as well, with his fashion and the way he dresses and stuff like that. I think people maybe look at him sometimes and think, is he a little bit flaky? Is is he a little bit soft? And I just think that's so unfair when you look at the way in which he he <laughs> he, he puts his body on the line, the way he battles, the way he contests for everything. Like he's 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 a warrior as well as a centre forward sometimes, isn't he? Yeah, well, I, th- I think last night was would be the perfect response to, to any of those criticisms. Wasn't it? You know, the fact that he had been trained all week and the fact that he was, you know, unwell and, and then he goes and puts in that type of performance and, and, and played that well against those centre-backs. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just one of them now. You just hope, you know, Adam's kind of touched on it there beforehand and that you hope now he can just really kick on from, from, from that perspective. Um, and I, I think it's it's hard to, to lose perspective. It's like, I know he's played a lot more football this season, but it, it's not as simple as, especially after pretty much missing two years on the bounce, it was never going to be as simple as, you know, as long as he gets a consistent run of games, he'll, he'll, he'll start scoring goals again, especially in a side that, let's be honest, has been faltering for the last couple of months it's always going to be difficult anyway so w- when you combine that with the the fact that he's, he's pretty much playing catch up he's lost two years of, of his career through no fault of his own um it, it was always going to take time for him to get back up to speed and, 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 and let's be honest we might never see him up to the level that we saw him under under Carlo Ancelotti not just because of he might not reach those levels himself but <laughs> the squad itself might never reach the levels again while he's here to have in the likes of of Hamas Rodriguez or, or Lucas Dean providing the, the assist for him, so that's that again is going to have some for some sort of quantitative effect. So, I, I think maybe in especially with I suppose the the lack of understudy at times, and, and I know we've had better this season, but but I suppose his I suppose involvement's not been as as significant as maybe we would have expected in the summer. But I, I think maybe there's been a little bit of we st- we still need to be patient with him. I, th- I think maybe next year will be will be the season where he can have a, a proper, um, you know, preseason. If I remember correctly, he was still pretty much um, uninvolved in, in preseason games. I think he was. I can't know whether he, I don't think he was involved on the first day. Was he against Fulham? And then obviously came on. Well, well he played like half an hour against Villa, didn't he? And, and and then I don't think we saw him again until after the first international break. So. I think what will be key for him now will, you know, if he can end the the season on a high, I think it's like three goals in his last four games now, I think it is, isn't it? Or or maybe three in his last three, is it? I, I think. Uh, um, he didn't score against Forest, did he? But no, you say yeah, three in his last four. Three and four, um, yeah. So, so if he can continue that and get, get maybe another two before the end of the season, and then get, uh, you know, a nice, a nice little break, you know, a nice holiday somewhere and, and come back. You know, into preseason, actually partaking in, in, in the entirety of it. Um, you know, because even even now, I'm, I'm sure Paddy's hinted that in some of his pieces that, you know, even at this point, training wise, he's still not involved 100% all of the time, just because of that. I suppose carefulness around it. So we can come back next season, and and it's more normal, and it's we've got more of a, a cohesive unit around him from an attacking sense. Then hopefully we, we can we can see him even even to like you know when Ancelotti first arrived at those type of levels again because let's be honest you know there's, there's not many strikers in the league who could have performed the way he did last night never mind ones who are in Everton's budget so he he's he's an asset ultimately and and hopefully he can kick on them. Yeah, that that's right, isn't it, Pete? You know, I think when he does play like that, you can see why he was you know Kane's understudy for a spell. You know, with England and why you know there are times where he was linked to, to massive clubs because all round threat. You know, like like Adam said, he is rapid, he is strong, he, he can carry the ball. His his spring is, you know, I've never seen a player leap quite like that. And maybe he doesn't use that as a as, as much as he should sometimes to to score goals and get on the end of, of crosses. But it it is all there, isn't it? It's just it's just putting it together in terms of his durability physically and, and consistency as well on the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, he, he's still recovering, not just from injuries, but from horrendous mismanagement from, from previous managers. Um, I know that, you know, under, under Rafa Benitez, for example, he was so desperate to get him in the side. He was rushing him back and then he break down again. I think Benitez ended up sacking some of his medical staff because because they disagreed with him um, when, when they'd said that the Calvaloon wasn't ready to play and, and he ended up getting injured. And I think as well, the nature of the injuries that he've got, he's had, you know, in terms of hamstrings and uh, in particular, a lot of his game is based on the the type of mechanics that, that the hamstrings will be so important to. So, like you say, when you talk about his pace, his leaping, um, even I mean, you can't underestimate the, the amount of physicality in terms of the amount of blows that you get as a centre forward, especially if you're playing up front on your own when you've got a centre half right up your back for for the whole game. Um, you know, Duncan Ferguson suffered from a, a number of injuries throughout his career. From basically having one-on-one duels with with centre halves, where it's a, it's a constant attack on 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 your body, um. So I think it was massively important for Sean Dyche to give him a little bit of space. You know, towards the end of last season, he didn't rush him back, which was important. Um, this season, 
even during this, this sort of barren spell that he had when he had when he hadn't been scoring, he was still coming off on the hour every game. You know, he wasn't he wasn't ready for ninety minutes, and I think it it, it would have been, you know, the the manager could have really stuck to it and tried to play him through and and tried to sort of go against his is. It, you know what, what he believed was best for the player if he thought that it was best for the team but I think that Dyches managed him superbly um, and it was all about just breaking that duck and the goal against Newcastle the penalty against Newcastle was so important for him for his confidence um, and, and he's kicked on and, and, and like you say these last few games if we, if Calvert-Lewin can, can keep up this form go into the summer full of confidence and hopefully get himself fit you know or keep himself fit and build himself up physically as well play with a bit more freedom as well because the more goals he gets, the more time he goes without injuries, the the more time he has injuries to settle down. Psychologically, he'll feel better and he'll feel more ready to be able to go out there and and, and use his attributes to the fullest. Um so yeah, I think I think Dominic Calvert Lewin last night, that that is the Dominic Calvert Lewin um that 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 I rate so highly. Um and I really hope that he can keep it up and and good luck to him. Um but but as I say I think he's so important and a player, uh, as it's been alluded to, it, you know, if he was on the transfer market, I don't think he's the type of player we could afford. So we've got to make the most of him while we've got him. Yeah, 100%. Um, just as well, like in, in terms of the, the game itself, I know um, I know it was Klopp's last derby, um, their sort of title race put on hold a little bit. Um, I know you sort of say that, to be not really bothered about them, but those little moments kind of make it a little bit sweeter, you know. Van Dyke in particular, Jesus Christ! I've never, I've never seen a footballer moan at the referee as much in my life for for a match which had virtually no flash points in it whatsoever. I think that again, that might be where it's almost like I haven't felt that like anger or like hate towards him because like, last night they just got bullied, like they just got a a, a a proper doing which we don't do, and that's probably where a lot of the time the bitterness comes from is that. Yeah, they're better than us, but they get the rub of the green or they get a decision or they get something that creeps over the line, which may have not done for us type of thing. And, and actually, last night, that, that was our night. That, that wasn't Everton you know, getting a result against Liverpool. That was just Everton winning the game, full stop. And and you can yeah, you can have your Van Dykes and your Klops who are moaning and the fairy tale that they thought it was going to be is just being whisked away from them by some average 16th, 17th place side. But But at the same time, that's it just comes back to the fact that we need to do this more often. We need to do what we did last night to seven to ten teams away from home every year and fifteen teams at home every year. And that comes down to having what what a few times we've mentioned is that there's there's a plan. You're not shopping and changing your manager every two years. So then you've got what, thirty lads in a squad that have got fifteen managers between them. And I think sometimes it's yeah, it's it's, it's easy for us to play the victim because we have had bad things against us this year. We have had your deductions and we don't know what's going on upstairs. But last night when it just came down to football, that was a side that's just beaten your biggest rivals and deserved to beat them. And yeah, let them have the moan, let them have the cry because we, we're usually the ones that are trying to find an excuse. But last night they're trying to find an excuse. And you look at all these things about Klopp leaving, Box Park, full of the Reds. It's just brilliant, isn't it? Oh. Like it is just great, isn't it? And, and, I don't hate Liverpool because I'm not asked about them. Genuinely, no one hates Everton more than me. But when you have moments like that, that is that is why you, you want to do them over because you see it all over the place that entitlement is one thing, but when you get that little bit of a, of, a, of a one over on them, it feels so much sweeter. It means more, as someone would say. That yeah, that is a great way of putting it. I swear I've heard that somewhere before. Uh... <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, Box Park have got some rebuilds. They're having the make their PR. They've, uh, I mean, obviously, we weren't affiliated to the Denby. I'd offer to go, go and do a show down there, get some get some blues in. But uh, we are very much tied up, unfortunately. But um, but but but, but those lads haven't had a great start, have they? The social media is very quiet today, uh, which is <laughs> interesting. I've tried to refresh it a couple of times, but maybe maybe Instagram's got some sort of issues or something because it was very 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 busy beforehand. But then, um, but yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, and it's crap anyway. Yeah, I'm sure that there's sure eight quid, just, eight quid pints poised to be lashed up in the air for when they scored. Uh, unfortunately, they, they didn't get thrown anywhere. Yeah, people actually drank them. <laughs> <laughs> I love to know uh, the marketing strategy when they try and when they open a new place for the first time outside of where they are. 
and they instantly alienate 50% of the population of where they're going to. Like, what yeah. what marketing genius do they have working for them? Yeah. Serves them right. Very Mad, did it? Because, like, I, I actually genuinely, like, that's the happiest thing I've felt about the whole, like, Liverpool rivalry over the past few days. Like, you're so fucking stupid that you think it's a good idea to open something like that, which has such capacity for brilliant nights when Everton are playing and brilliant nights when Liverpool are playing, and then you just look like fucking fools. So, unfortunately, you've alienated yourselves. And the Reds won't go even in there now because they'll go, oh, we lost last time, that's a jinx. I think they probably wanted, like, the videos of the Yale getting lashed yeah. down. Yeah. Week, like, when Liverpool... they gone for, innit? Like... Scruffs on the guitars and that. It's just cringe mode, like, innit? I, th- <laughs> like, I don't think that's any... Like, I don't think like that's Liverpool as a city anyway, is it, really? It's, it feels oh. very, like, England fan... Yeah, but it's a London yeah. thing, isn't it? Box Park in, in Shoreditch. I've been a few times. It stinks. It's sticky floor. It's full of helmets. So, maybe it suits them. There you go. Uh, what an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god! I hope no one listening will like plans to offer us a deal or something. Uh, ne- ne- next podcast, we might, might have to retract a little bit. It's actually all right. The box park, you know, sponsored by box park. Yeah, put a put a big fat contract in front of us, and I'm sure uh... we, can, we can get Adam to change his mind. Uh... <laughs> just just before we finish, where, where does that rank, Derby's for you? You know, I, I tentatively, semi flippantly described it as the greatest football match ever played on on post match last night. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. Too far removed from that still. It, it was pretty much perfect, P, from my point of view. Yeah, I've I've been thinking about this all day. Um the the Kadamatri one for me was was the one where that was the first one I've been to that we won. So that that's always got a special place in my heart. Um the obviously the Arteta Kale one, the Andy Johnson one, the Dan Gosling one. But I think that for like, that last night for me was just perfect. It it, it was the atmosphere at Goodison was absolutely electric from even before kickoff. Uh, everything came together. I've got to, just just as well, just something to mention. It was great for once that a referee was fair, and I mean, I mean, the referee refereed the game like a referee and not someone who was being influenced by all their moaning and 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 being one sided. Which for a Merseyside derby, I think that's the best referee in performance I've seen. And in a Merseyside derby, kept his head cool, didn't start throwing cards around everywhere. Um, I'm going to go as far as saying that's the best one I've been in, uh, just because of everything, everything came together, what it meant as well. And also the fact that we, um, as I said earlier on, cost them the league, which they deserve. Mick, how about you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, isn't it? It probably is. Like like, as, like I mentioned before, that was the first one I'd, I'd been to live, which we'd won. Um, so it, it probably will be number one, but it's, it's still tough with... You know, the Andy Johnson 3 0, that was my first season following Everton. So when that happened, I thought that's, you know, I was in for a whole lifetime of happiness. And I think we only had, I think we had three since then or something like that. And then the Dan Carsling as well, with what, what Peter mentioned before, you know, just because it was a cup match. I'm fairly sure Gerard got subbed off early in that game as well, didn't he? And, uh, you know, that was celebrated like a goal. So, so yeah, I think definitely in my top three with those three. Uh, I- yeah, I think even just looking at Pete's background now, like it, it's it's growing on me more and more. That that header, that moment, and again, this is the, the first derby I've missed in a long, long time. And it just feels so apt that that was exactly what you would paint a picture of if someone said, draw your perfect Merseyside derby win. And and, and that's what it was. So that, it, of course, it's it, it, I was jumping around with, with Lambs last, yesterday and my dog was biting me and jumping up at me but uh, the Dan Gosling one for me is, is I don't know why because I think that season I went to every every home and away game for Everton uh, and the away game was was great as well if you remember I know we didn't win it but uh, we were one up didn't we and Les got scored and flicked it in off Kale or, or vice versa and um, yeah then taking it back to Goodison and winning in what the 119th minute that yeah. winger who crossed it in for us what a player he was for us that was when uh, Van <laughs> That was when Kale pointed at the cop, wasn't it? Like, the first game on field, yeah. Laughing. Yeah. Um, but they're all good and they don't come off enough, so let's make it a more of an occurrence. And very finally, what are we going to call that? You, you obviously got the Goslin one, the Kadamatri one. What, what's that one going to be? Because the, the, the Carl Klopp one. one. The, the Klopp one. The Box Park one. <laughs> The box park derby. The box park derby. <laughs> the, clock, the, the clock farewell tour derby. 
Because <laughs> yeah. the the Calvert Lewin and Bramfweight one it doesn't really roll off the tongue. Maybe it's something the listeners can help us out with. We need we need a snappy name for last night. But um, just look, I'm... you uh, you lost the league at Goodison Park, Derby. There you go. <laughs> I'm I'm sure I'm sure over time we will find a way to describe it. Um, but yeah, love to go through it. Again, lads, uh, I think we're all off to bed after this. Uh, certainly, Adam, who's been awake all night. <laughs> Cheers, lad, Pete, and Mick. Uh, Dave's going to be back tomorrow uh, with another show. We'll have mailbag. Uh, we'll have a preview for Brentford. God, we've got Brentford on, on Saturday. Is anyone going to be asked about that? Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be previewing that in a bit more detail as well and have your instant reaction uh, to that game too. We'll, we'll probably just talk about Wednesday a, a bit more, to be honest. Um, but yeah. Cheers for tuning in. Thanks for all the comments about last night in the post-match as well. Uh, we'll speak to you again soon here on the Blue Room. Up the toppies.